So I never imagined that I could have a career as a scientist when I was first drawn to nursing. My fascination with the profession came from the awe I experienced as a Peace Corps volunteer, watching Malian nurses and midwives deliver babies by the light of a kerosene lamp, and how women like Aminata spend hours crouched over dusty concrete floors using nothing but her ears and her eyes and her hands and her sharp assessment tools to support and care for these mothers and children without the backup of an OR or an IV pump or a doctor or any other type of technology. So I knew that nursing had a lot to do with courage and with the art and the act of caring. But nursing is also a science that is ever evolving and incorporating new ways of knowing from stem cell research and genomics in laboratory settings to community-based participatory action research to the use of wearable sensors and big data and artificial intelligence. But first and foremost, nursing is a science grounded in concepts like caring and human dignity and wellness. And by partnering with people and seeking to understand their goals and their strengths and their needs and their stories, whether those stories are written in words or in muscle and scar, or even inscribed in their DNA. We come to see our fellow human beings as complex individuals who deserve respect. So this July, I was down in Washington, DC with several other inventor scientists because we had all just been named invention ambassadors by the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And invention ambassadors are people tasked with promoting the radical act of invention and before we left DC, we were asked for our advice on how to create the best and brightest scientists and inventors of the future. And while I listened to my colleagues throw out their ideas from their disciplines, which ranged from chemistry to computer science, I thought about what makes nursing such a unique and vital discipline in STEM. And more specifically, about all the amazing nurse scientists who'd come before me. People like Bessie Blunt Griffin, who in the 50s and 60s developed and patented an electronic system that would allow veterans who'd been paralyzed to have greater control over eating. Or people like Jackie Campbell, a fierce advocate for violence prevention research who used data to create the first assessment tool that could help predict the risk that someone might be harmed by an abusive partner. Or Lupe Hernandez, who as a nursing student in the 1960s first proposed gel-based Hennessy hand sanitizers like Purell, or Lillian Wald and Dame Cecily Saunders who gave us modern hospice, and I could just go on and on about the hundreds and hundreds of nursing innovations that are all grounded in our caring science. And caring is a word that gets thrown out a lot, much like empathy, which is part of caring. So I want to say up front that nursing has a whole body of theory and knowledge and measurement tools and research on caring, because we know caring isn't simple. It's often complex and difficult and undervalued and too frequently confused with simply having good intentions or thinking you know what someone needs and trying to help them out. I don't know if any of you in this room, have you ever been helped by someone in a way that wasn't particularly helpful? Yeah, so you know what I mean. Actual caring requires investment and being in relationship and deep listening and respect. So when it was my turn to share, I offered up caring and empathy, not just as skills we could teach, but as metrics for judging the quality of our institutions in STEM and as a way to do better science. And I didn't get much farther than that because the guy running the conversation then quickly helped me out by explaining that um, empathy was already covered in STEM curricula because scientists learn empathy when they practice debate. And I guess... <laughs> In my mind, you know, debate is less about human caring and empathy as it is imagining you think you know what the other person's going to say and anticipating their argument so you can crush them. Um, so I, <laughs> I, I think um, uh, my, my message about human caring may have been lost a little in translation. And it reminded me of all the other times 
where often as the only nurse in the room wearing my scientist cap, I'd been part of discussions and presentations about new medical technologies and devices and drugs that people had often been developing for years and years with hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions in investment. At the point at which it becomes clear that the scientists have never once actually engaged a caregiver or a person with this particular condition to understand whether they're even solving the right problem in the first place. Or simply the way that we as scientists talk about other people in our work, using dehumanizing and pathologizing language, forever presenting graphs of people who are too sick or too poor or too uneducated or too inactive or my favorite, non-compliant with prescribed therapies. We use labels and identifiers we would never use to a person's face. And I think part of this is because scientists do not always see themselves as being in relationship to the people they're studying. And they confuse this with being objective. And objectivity is a hallmark of science. It's what sets science apart from you know, pseudoscience and fake news. But, you know, um, some people could, I see how they could think that caring might be at odds with objectivity. Um, and on this point, I could not disagree more. Yes, as scientists, we are required to be transparent and rigorous about our methods and to acknowledge factors that might influence the outcomes, such as bias. And there is always room for bias, even though science is the best system we have so far, you know, because science at its heart is fundamentally a human endeavor. Even disciplines like physics have bias. Physics, which, if, if you know, there's a hierarchy in science, and physics sits at the tippity top of the pyramid, the most fundamental or hard science. And um, even physics can have bias. For, ex uh, for instance, the kilogram. You know, I always thought about the kilogram as one of the most fundamental and fixed units of measurement. But just last month, the definition of what a kilogram is changed. And it changed because real human people got together in a room and debated and discussed and decided to change it from the mass of a slowly deteriorating hunk of platinum and iridium that sits in a vault in Paris to a fixed value based on the speed of light and Planck's constant. So caring is not an enemy of good science. Empathy and deep listening and compassion are powerful vehicles for exploring human connection and potent catalysts for scientific discovery. And it's that effort to put caring in our science that has inspired some of the work of our team these last several years. One of the first issues we addressed was the problem of medical gaslighting. Are you all familiar with gaslighting? The thing where you have like a real serious problem and someone often in a position of authority tells you it's just all in your head. This is a significant challenge, particularly for people dealing with symptoms like pain and fatigue that may be invisible and very hard to show to others, unlike perhaps a medical scar or losing your hair. And I work with a lot of people who've been treated for cancer, and this can be really distressing, especially when it persists and it's affecting their daily lives. And unfortunately, we have a medical system that tends to make it easier to monitor and measure in blood tests than to actually listen to what people are saying about their experience. So we partnered with some computer scientists and neuroscientists and a molecular biologist and we started working on some new technology that could actually measure some of the functional impacts of fatigue through looking at eye movements. And our hypothesis was we may not be able to fix the fatigue, but at very least perhaps we can give people tools by which to make the invisible more visible to others and by extension have their voices heard. We also spent hundreds of hours in conversation in people's homes, particularly people who'd been treated for cancer, and we listened when they described to us their distress around possibly exposing loved ones to some of the drugs that were passing through their bodies. Drugs like chemotherapy. Because these days, many chemotherapies are available as pills you can take at home. And while people are on these therapies, sometimes they abstain from some of the most meaningful and important activities of daily life. Activities like breastfeeding, or taking care of small children, or sharing beds and bathrooms, or sexual intimacy with their partners. And depending on the nature of the drug and the activity, there's not always great evidence to support this, but part of putting caring into science is acknowledging that the fear is real. 
So we worked with oncosexologists and pharmacologists and chemical engineers, and we started building some of the first devices that may eventually allow people to detect these drugs in places like semen and vaginal fluid and breast milk and urine, so that they can verify when they've fully passed through their system. And we also listened to people when they told us they were experiencing pain, particularly a type of pain known as peripheral neuropathies that can be caused by certain nerve-harming drugs and chronic conditions. It's this pins and needles, stabbing sensation, sometimes numbness, that happen in fingers and in toes and even in genital areas. And again, if there's not a good drug to treat something sometimes, people are just kind of told to learn to live with it. One woman was telling me how it was so bad that in the mornings, just the act of getting her shoes on could leave her crumpled on the floor and sobbing. So we were in partnership with a kinesiologist who knew some things about how certain types of vibrations can affect nerves that have been harmed and a chemist who uses nanotechnology to coat fabrics and make them vibrate. And it's all very early days, but we're now beginning to explore making new types of garments, like gloves and socks and underwear, that may someday be able to help relieve some of this suffering. And a common theme you may have noticed here is teamwork. We couldn't do this work without a broad and diverse range of perspectives, not just from other scientists, from the people, too, that we are designing for. And we don't think that this type of partnership should be reserved just for our research studies. We think that these types of uh, caring approaches to science should also be part of the culture of STEM and STEM institutions. Because for people who identify as women, people of color, people who are LGBTQ, who are neurodiverse and living with disability, and first-generation STEM institutional structures can be really hard places to survive, much less thrive, and not just because of societal injustices like racist and sexist systems of power that gatekeep who gets to be there in the first place, but because institutional culture and the metrics by which we judge success do not necessarily value human dignity and being in relationship or the effort it takes to have truly inclusive practice and to maintain well-being. And recent reports from the National Academies and blogs like Me Too STEM and hashtags like Everyday Ableism and even a report in The Atlantic just this last week highlighting extremely high levels of anxiety and depression and thoughts of self-harm among STEM trainees really bring this into sharp focus. And it cannot and should not be on the people who've been harmed by STEM institutions to solve this problem. The leadership, the institutions themselves, need better metrics by which we judge quality. And I think the T for technology in STEM could use some caring metrics as well. Uh, recently, I was reading the headlines, and this one popped up from AARP, and it read, the robot caregivers of our future. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, fudge. Um, <laughs> Because as a human caregiver who has cared for people, some of the people who've been surrounded by the world's best technologies, I know that technology can do a lot of good, but also technology divorced from human caring is just a tool. And um, one person I will never forget, one of the first people I took care of on my cancer unit, I worked with him for months and months following his transplant. And as his condition deteriorated, due to multiple complications, he became more and more reliant on technology, um, but also more and more distant and removed and isolated from the roles and relationships that were most meaningful in his life, and also from human touch. Because I could measure and monitor his vital signs down to the nanosecond, but to make time in that system to even just be present at the bedside for a few minutes and allow him to be seen that was really difficult in that system. And around the same time in the state I was in, they were shutting down Meals on Wheels programs. And part of the justification they gave was that, well, the same nutritional value can be delivered through the mail, or maybe someday by drones from Amazon.com. And those of us who were in relationship with people who were homebound and the volunteers who served them in the community knew that the true value of Meals on Wheels was so much more than micronutrients. It was human connection, 
and the vital importance of being in relationship and feeling seen and feeling valued. And machines will never be a substitute for that. So as artificial intelligence and technology more and more replace certain types of human interaction, both in the hospital and at home, those of us who are scientists and inventors need the tools and assessments and metrics by which to capture the human caring that is also being lost and to design systems that ensure that that vital need for human caring is still met, albeit perhaps in new and creative ways. So we don't know if everything we're building will work yet or if all of this science will make it out into people's lives, but we know we have to try. And the fact that we are trying and engaging and listening, the people we work with tell us that that brings them hope. The kind of hope and scientific advancements that can only be made when we make caring the foundation upon which we build new inventions and do good science. Thank you.